studies on the effect of, of sulfur contaminated uh, uh, ferromagnetic metals for uh, Fischer-Tropsch reactions, and Wayne Goodman's surface science work. Uh, and we've made a lot of use of both of these areas. But as a, as a means of introducing what I'm going to talk about here, this uh, slide uh, which is a really a schematic diagram of a metal catalyst particle shown in red and the deposit at the back which is filamentous carbon you can see that when you look at that that system there are three interfaces that we must be concerned with the active surface of the metal which will change uh, depending on what gas and gas environment that that system is exposed to. It can also be affected by the support on which it's sitting. There is the catalyst particle itself, the chemical nature of that particle, whether it's a metal, uh, a metal alloy, and also what we do to that surface. And that's the, the essence of what I want to talk about today, is what happens when we introduce sulfur atoms into that surface. And then finally, the, the interface between the catalyst particle and the deposited carbon. The type of carbon, the character of that carbon, is determined to a very large degree on the nature of the interaction of the metal crystallites at the back of the particle with the deposited carbon. If you have a, a metal which readily wets graphite, we find that the deposit at the back, filamentous, whisker-like structure, is primarily graphite. On the other hand, if the system doesn't wet graphite, then the deposit tends to be somewhat more amorphous in nature. And what I've listed on the right are the various techniques that we're using to look at those three interfacial regions. We use a probe reaction of a simple hydrocarbon molecule Ethylene is the one I'm going to talk about here. And we analyze the total products, gas phase and solid carbon, as a function of reaction conditions. And we also look at the effect of additives uh, to the metal on those product distributions. Um, we characterize the catalyst by a number of uh, methods primarily based on, on in-situ electron microscopy, and we're actually doing the reaction inside the microscope. This is not a, a reactor on the side of the microscope and then putting it in. It's all conducted in the microscope, so we can visually watch the, the carbon <coughs> forming, and now we can actually analyze the particle while it's reacting using the electron diffraction mode. And then finally, we look at the character of the carbon itself, again using the microscopy techniques, and also TPR, X-ray, and electron diffraction. So we're trying to follow what happens to these three interfaces as a function of reaction conditions. Okay, the approach we've used here, and I, I want to emphasize at the outset, our desire is not to achieve complete sulfur coverage of the surface. We are not at equilibrium <coughs> conditions. We are merely trying to modify that surface. So we pretreat the catalyst, whether it's, uh, in this case, uh, for the talk today, it will be a metal powder. We also look to supported metal particles. We uh, treat it in such a way that we are modifying that surface, and it will change as it goes on stream. So we're really trying to attempting to simulate what Wayne Goodman does or did in his surface science studies. <coughs> this is the, the type of deposit I'm, I'm talking about, and in contrast to the schematic diagram which I showed you initially for a carbon filament, that would be the case of a filament formed from a pure metal. This is what happens when you modify the metal. In this case, the catalyst particle, and uh, I don't have the pointer. Right in front. Oh, thank you. I'll try and highlight the catalyst particle for you. Here it is. 
it's actually locate, located within the filament. What we've got here is a, is a twinned crystal. The gas solid interface is where I'm taking the pointer now. It's halfway through the crystal. And the carbon is being deposited from two faces of the particle, uh, one here and one here, so that the filament grows in a bi-directional mode. So it's a, quite a difference when you modify that catalyst particle. Okay, what, let's have a look now at the, the character of the carbon deposit as a function of various pretreatment conditions in sulfur. And what I show you here are three properties three separate samples. The first sample is the unadulterated <coughs> copper powder catalyst starting material. And you can see that the average filament width that we're making here is around 300 nanometers in size. And that would be the size of the catalyst particle associated with them. Now, bear in mind this is starting from a powder which is about a micron in size. So during the reaction, we're getting fragmentation with, of the powdered uh, material. When we look at the oxidation characteristics in CO2, we find that the, the filaments that have been produced from pure cobalt start to oxidize at about 835 degrees centigrade. Now, if we take single crystal graphite, and take it through the same oxidation procedure, it would start to oxidize at about 850. So you can see that the types of filaments we're making from the pure metal are getting close to pure graphite in their oxidation uh, characteristics. Surface areas of the material, about 55 square meters per gram. Now as we start to pretreat the cobalt in various levels of H2S, uh, things start to change with the carbon deposit. You can see that the filaments on average now are getting smaller. So sulfur is inducing fragmentation, that's one thing. Um, they are also becoming less graphitic in nature. What that is telling us is that the back face of the catalyst particle, sulfur is modifying the wetting characteristics of the metal. It's, it's making it more non-wetting, producing a norm more non-graphitic filament. And finally, the, the, uh, in, concomitantly, the surface area of these structures is increasing. They're becoming much more disordered. Okay, well, these were the conclusions that we can make by, by following the behavior of individual catalyst particles inside the electron microscope and also looking at the the character of the deposit after reaction in conventional transmission microscopy. We know that sulfur is inducing some fragmentation and that that in itself might contribute to a certain degree of increase in the amount of carbon that you might make. You'll see that in the ensuing slides that is indeed the case. As we increase the level of, of sulfur on the, on the cobalt surface, the Filaments become more disordered, less graphitic, higher surface area. So that we know that sulfur is modifying the behavior of the interaction with carbon. But let's now turn and look at what happens to, to the gas phase products. And this is um, a statement of, of the type of, of systems that we've looked at. We've, we've done these reactions in a flow reactor at about 535 degrees C. We pretreated the metal powders in various levels of H2S hydrogen and then reacted them in ethylene hydrogen mixtures. We, we measure the amount of solid carbon. It's done two ways. It's done continuously by, by mass balances and we check with other experiments done for the same periods where we actually weigh the amount of carbon. And those two measurements are within about 5%. We also look at the total gas phase products as a function of time, and then also uh, examine the nature of the deposit. Okay, well, this 
to our amazement, because I started out looking at deactivation, and this is how this proposal was funded, turns out to be the opposite. The point, the yellow arrow down here on, on the graph, which is a presentation of the percent of solid carbon that we're depositing as a function of the hydri uh, hydrogen disulfide concentration, you can see that without pretreatment, zero H2S, we're getting very little carbon produced on the catalyst. As we progressively increase the amount of the, the level of the sulfide pretreatment, the level of carbon increases dramatically. It goes from about 4% up to over 70% by weight. Now it's interesting, and it follows very much from the first talk, the question was posed, is the weight of carbon related to catalyst deactivation? It is not. Because this is a much more active catalyst when it's been pretreated in about 10 ppm H2S than it is in the unadulterated state. We plot that out in, in a different form. There's some other facts I, I'd like to bring to your attention. Again, we're plotting the percentage of, of solid carbon deposit, but now as a function of reaction time for three different levels of pretreatment. 1 ppm, well, we get quite a lot of enhancement, but we lose that sulfur very quickly during the reaction. It's swept out, so we, we tend to lose the beneficial effects. As we go to higher sulfide levels, then you can see that we maintain a fairly equilibrium level of solid carbon on the catalyst. But there's another thing you should, you should also be aware of, that there is an induction time. For a catalyst, for instance, that's pretreated in 500 ppm H2S, and that's shown as the sea green uh, line, you can see there's no reaction for about 100 minutes, and then suddenly the catalyst comes on stream. What that is telling us is that 100 ppm level of sulfur is very high. We have to lose some of that surface sulfur. And that is indeed what's happening. We're gradually removing sulfur so that the catalyst now, once it becomes active, is probably nearer to one which is, say, 10 ppm than 500 ppm. We've lost the loosely absorbed sulfur. So that what is remaining on the catalyst surface is very strongly absorbed sulfur. This is just a, a reiteration of what I've told you. The, the increase, as you increase the, the level of sulfiding, we go from about 4.5% solid carbon for the pure catalyst up to about 70% by weight of carbon on the catalyst. It mimics very much the same effect we find when we add copper to these metals. Copper also induces the same kind of behavior in nickel as does sulfur in nickel or cobalt. Um, as we go to higher and higher H2S levels, then eventually we can kill the catalyst completely. That is well known. Everybody who studied this would have found that. But at low levels, you can actually activate the catalyst. Let's look at now the, the gas phase product distribution. Uh, I picked out here three product uh, in, well, two products in addition to the solid carbon, which is not shown here, but with, with, a, with no H2S pretreatment, you can see very little reaction. Small amount of methane and a small amount of, <coughs> of, uh, of ethane produced from the decomposition of the, the ethylene. As we look at a catalyst now that's been pretreated for 30 minutes at 4 ppm H2S, you can see it very quickly reaches equilibrium levels after about 25 minutes on stream, ethylene, hydrogen, one to one at 5.30. The amount of methane which is produced is fairly <coughs> constant, as is the amount of ethane. If we compare that with a catalyst which has been Shown here again the 4 ppm. Now let's look at what happens with 100 ppm. Remember there was an induction period before the catalyst became active. It's also 
manifested here in, in the uh, distribution of the gas phase products. It takes about 60 minutes for that catalyst to show about the same level of reactivity as one pretreated at 4 ppm. Move it on, please. Thank you. So what we believe is happening here, that, that H2S is, is certainly modifying the absorption characteristics of the olefin on the metal. The two major products, gas-based products we're making, methane and, and ethane, are coming directly from this reaction. They are not coming, for instance, from hydrogasification of carbon. We do get some, but there's a lot of methane coming from another route. And what we're now trying to do is attempting to use these gas phase products to build up a model of what the surface <coughs> might look like. Now, I don't have time to go into a great detail of it, but let's just watch what happens here as we add or introduce a foreign element into a metal. And if you can imagine, the, the red balls are cobalt, the green one is sulfur. We are modifying that surface and as a consequence, when the ethylene molecule absorbs on the modified surface, where it contacts two unperturbed metal atoms, the olefin will tend to interact in a parallel fashion. In contrast, where you've got an add atom which does not chemisorb the hydrocarbon, then there is the possibility that the hydrocarbon will be absorbed in what one might call an end-on configuration. And the ramifications of this on the products, we look at this in a little bit more detail, I've just picked out here the, the two different uh, configurations of where the hydrocarbon could lay down. One could imagine uh, two options here in, in the case where it forms parallel to the surface. The carbon-carbon bond could undergo scission and the fragments could then interact and, and maybe dis, uh, diffuse through the metal particle and precipitate to form the carbon deposit. On the other hand, they can react with hydrogen and desorb from the surface as, uh, as ethane. Where we have the, the modified metal particles in the vicinity of a sulfur atom, then there is the tendency for the ethylene to absorb in this endon or ethylidine intermediate structure. And when this intermediate decomposes, the CC bond breaks, the molecule is going to be released, will pick up a, or the radical produced will pick up a hydrogen atom and then leave the surface as methane. Carbon that's left will then dissolve in the metal and contribute to the carbon filament formation. So, to cut a long story short, by following the products and measuring them as a function of time, we can come to some rather crude calculations which show that the number of metal metal neighbors is related to the total amount of solid carbon plus the yield of ethane. And we can use that to construct the model of the surface. Uh, at various conditions. And this is our attempt to do it. It certainly is available to throw bricks at, but it, it is built on in situ measurements. And what we think is happening at fairly low sulfur coverage, well below saturation, where we're getting instantaneous reaction with the ethylene, that we've got this type of, uh, of structure shown on the far left-hand side. As the metal is exposed to higher and higher levels of sulfur, we then go through a phase where we've got a two-dimensional surface sulfide, it's still surface, and that is the condition where there would be a short induction period in order to release the weakly held sulfur to reach the activated state. And finally, at high levels of sulfur, we make a three-dimensional bulk sulfide. Well, to some degree, we've supported that conclusion by in situ uh, electron diffraction. Electron diffraction analysis of the first two species was, just shows metallic state, because the diffraction is looking at bulk. 
On the other hand, with systems treated at high sulfur levels, we see the three-dimensional bulk sulfide formation. And in many cases, you can't run the reaction long enough in order to get back to the activated state. Okay, let me uh, conclude by saying that we believe that the enhancement in, in carbon deposition and in catalytic activity at, at low levels of H2S is related to both the fraction and the distribution of sulfur in the surface of the metal. <coughs> and at high sulfur loadings, where we're making now uh, two-dimensional and in the extreme three-dimensional metal sulfides, we completely kill the catalyst activity. Um, this work is continuing. Uh, we, we look now at supported metal systems. It follows exactly the same type of behavior. We're now moving in to look at other electronegative elements other than sulfur, how they affect carbon deposition. And finally, I, I want to thank uh, the sponsors of this work, Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences, and also my two co-workers who, without them, this work couldn't have been done. That's Drs. Myung Soo Kim, who did the reactor work, and, and Dr. Nelly Rodriguez, who did most of the diffraction work. Thank you. Questions, Cal? Terry, I'm very interested in the conditions under which you sulfide these samples. It has two important implications. Uh, if, if these were done at low temperature, you could have got bulk sulfiding at PPM, even at PPM levels. And the other question resolves about around whether you were able to get uniform coverage. It's very difficult to sulfide cattle in such a way that you can get uniform coverage of the of, of the metal with the uh, sulfur. Okay. So answer to your first question, yes. I mean, that's why we did it. We did it, the sulfiding at the temperature we were going to do the hydrogenation of, of ethylene. Which is? 535. Kelvin or centigrade? Degrees centigrade. Okay. Now, the second question, yet yeah, we do not know the distribution, the uniformity of that sulfur at all. We really don't. I don't think there's any way you can, you can find what it is. We're attempting with our modeling to do it, but I, it is, it's really a crude attempt, but I don't know any other way in which we, we could get to that uh, answer. Well, you might look at it with uh, AES. Or no, you can't look at, at these particles with AES. They're too small. Huh. If, it was a, if it was a single crystal surface, yes, but not these part they're far too small to see it. We, we did think about doing that, and the point is well taken. If you could do it, at reaction conditions. That's the other key. It's no good doing it after the reaction or in the vacuum because you're going to pull it all off. One so way uh, to guarantee a more uniform coverage is, is to use a CSTR type reactor. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you're right. We're, we're kind of learning to do chemical engineering. <laughs> other questions? Yes. Uh, what I didn't understand is you have two kinds of reaction, carbon-carbon cleavage to make methane and hydrogenation uh, to make ethane. Uh, I understood that you attribute the two kinds of reaction to two different sites, one that's near the sulfur atom and one it isn't. However, your selectivity didn't change uh, uh, with the coverage. I mean, and this is a part that I'm not sure I understand. I, I'm glad you've asked the question. It's a very important one because what it is telling us, Malvina, is that that surface is actually, over a period of time, regardless of the level of the pretreatment of sulfur, it is reaching a critical sulfur level on the surface. And that's, first of all, that's the reason for the induction period to reach that value. And I think the, the vindication of it is the product distributions. The fact that, if you remember that bar chart I showed you, after 60 minutes, a catalyst that was pretreated at 100 
PPM H2S looked almost identically uh, identical to that which was pretreated with 4 ppm. So the sulfur is being lost until it reaches a strongly adsorbed state. D does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Jerry.